All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Saturday, everybody. Happy NBA Playoffs Day. We have a jam-packed slate. We're going live after the final game of the night, which is the Nuggets versus the Lakers, but we'll be breaking down all four games. This video today, going to just go quickly for probably about 20 minutes on the two one versus eight matchups. Now, I want you guys to bear with me, obviously, under the circumstances. We got these matchups last night. We got games starting here at one o'clock Eastern today. So these are not going to be anywhere near as detailed as the series previews that I did for the other six series. But I did want to make sure that I gave you guys just my initial thoughts on these series. And obviously, we'll be covering them as we go along. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss show announcements. Don't forget about our podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts under hoops tonight. It's also super helpful if you leave a rating and a review on that front. And then last but not least, keep dropping mailbag questions in those YouTube comments. We're going to be doing some mailbags over the course of the postseason. So here's the deal. We're going to start with Heat Celtics. Really quick thoughts there because that series is by far the most lopsided uh, series that we have in the first round. After that, uh, Pelicans Thunder, and I have seven clips that will go through just a quick, again, nowhere near as much detail as the other ones, but I just want to give you some clips that I that I saw from my film session this morning. I did look at a little bit of film be, uh, uh, between those two teams. So we'll, uh, again, Heat Celtics, then we'll go Pelicans Thunder, and then a little bit of film. So on the Heat Celtics series, the Celtics won the season series three games to zero. They had a 130 offensive rating and a, a 115 defensive rating, so they completely dominated the matchup. Dominated the glass as well. They grabbed 55.2% of available rebounds. The gambling odds are insane. According to DraftKings right now, the Celtics are minus 3,000 favorites. So that is by far the largest favorite that we have in the first round. It was a big talent mismatch before Terry Rozier and Jimmy Butler got hurt. Now it's just a complete disaster. Miami just doesn't have the horses to hang in the series. So the outcome really isn't in question. The Celtics are going to win. The question is what value can be gained from either team. So I just want to kind of give you guys my my two cents on that. First of all, starting with Boston, you got to win the games within the game. And what I mean by that is we know Eric Spolstra, regardless of what I just said, is going to tell his team that he believes they can win. And so they're going to prepare as though they're going to win. And I expect the classic Eric Spolster defensive game plan. I expect to see a lot of zone in the half court. I expect to see some man-to-man -man full court pressure. I expect to see some zone full court pressure that drops back into a zone. I expect a bunch of different coverages. I expect Eric Spolstra to try to like basically make the series as janky as possible in hopes of giving his team a chance to keep these games competitive. So as the Celtics, you got to take that as a challenge, meaning like regardless of what the results of these games are, because you can piss down your leg against Spo's zone and still win the series. But take that as the challenge, meaning like win those games within the game, be able to respond quickly and effectively to the adjustments that Eric Spolstra makes. Secondly, establishing championship habits. The Celtics will have one of the easiest paths to the conference finals that you could ever hope to expect in this era of NBA basketball with how much talent there is. Even with my criticisms of the Eastern Conference, I do think there are five pretty damn good teams in the conference. I think Boston's good. I think Milwaukee's good. I think Indiana's good. I think Philly's good. And I think New York is good. Those are good teams, but all four that are not Boston are stacked up on the opposite side of the bracket. Orlando, Cleveland, and Miami are by far the three worst teams in that Eastern Conference playoff field. And so as a result, the Celtics are going to go basically the first month of the postseason without facing a real team. But when they get to the Eastern Conference Finals, it's going to be one of Indy, Milwaukee, New York, or Philly, probably the best team in that group. And then if you make it to the NBA Finals, you're going to face either Denver, the defending champion who I think is the best team in the league, or the team that beat Denver and survived that ridiculous gauntlet of Western Conference teams. And even those other four teams out east, Indiana, Milwaukee, um, <clears throat> and uh, New York and Philly, I think all of the top seven teams in the Western Conference, so the Lakers, the Mavs, the uh, the Suns, the Clippers, the Thunder, the Timberwolves, and the Nuggets, I think all seven of those teams are as good or better 
than that tier of teams that is in the Eastern Conference. So you're going to face somebody that's really good in the conference finals and someone that's amazing in the NBA finals, right? So what that means is you're going to go from two pretty easy series to two really tough series. And what that means is you have to be ready when you get to that point. Whoever comes out of that gauntlet on the opposite side of the Eastern Conference bracket is going to be coming off of four straight weeks of high-intensity, high-leverage basketball while you're going to be playing primarily unthreatened basketball. So what that means is in order to avoid falling into an early hole in the conference finals, or if you do happen to do well there to fall into a, a, an early hole in the NBA finals, you have to start establishing ha habits right now. Do not play down to the competition. Approach things with the requisite urgency and professionalism, that appropriate fear, so to speak, so that when you get to the really good opponents that you'll face la later on in your playoff run, you're ready for that challenge. That's going to be a big thing I'm looking for from Boston. On the Miami front, to me, this is more of just a learning experience about their shot creators. Tyler Harrow is going to be your primary perimeter initiator in this series for a legit playoff series against an elite defense. That's the first time he's ever going to get that challenge, and we're going to get to learn a lot about Tyler Harrow in that kind of context, right? Uh, specifically, Boston has a tendency, they'll run drop with Porzingis, but they have lineups that they'll go to, and they may do more switching over the course of the series. And Tyler Harrow's biggest weakness right now is he kind of needs a screen to get to his spots. And so that's going to be an interesting challenge for Tyler Harrow in this series. And then Bam Adebayo as well. Like This is a guy that the Heat have spent... Uh, a long time trying to develop into a higher level offensive player and he's continued to run into kind of hiccups along the way. This is a series where he can try to demonstrate a higher level offensive output. But the truth is, this is just a complete and total talent mismatch. So I expect the Celtics to sweep the Miami Heat. As a matter of fact, the odds for a sweep on DraftKings are plus 105, which is nearly even odds to uh to get a sweep from the Celtics it feels like the most likely scenario the 82 game preseason is in the books and now it's finally time for the real season don't miss out on any of the NBA playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook an official sports betting partner of the NBA from the play in tournament through the finals DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same game parlays live betting odds boosts, and so much more. The Boston Celtics are currently the favorite at plus 160, but the, the team that's third in my championship rankings, the Dallas Mavericks, you can get them on DraftKings right now at plus 1,600 to win the title. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. New customers bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's code HOOPS, H-O-O-P-S, only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Now, moving on to Pelicans Thunder. Um, as I told Pelicans fans after the Lakers kicked the shit out of them on Sunday, I said that the perfect set of circumstances for you guys would be to lose to the Lakers again on Tuesday because you would run into a series of matchups that would be favorable to you. Even if Golden State had managed to beat Sacramento, which they didn't, uh, Golden State's another team that kind of runs into the strengths that New Orleans brings to the table. Again, New Orleans' strength is perimeter defense. They have a lot of length and quickness on the perimeter. They get aggressive. They get all, they, they apply ball pressure. They force turnovers. They run out and transition. They're actually a very similar type of defense to the Oklahoma City Thunder, just with a little bit more length as opposed to strength. But the primary kind of matchup thing there was both the Kings and the Warriors are primarily initiated by perimeter finesse guards, right? And so as a result of that, you know, uh, the Pelicans are able to contain their offense, right? Of all of the matchups, and here's the thing, the Thunder are the better team. They're, they, they're the better basketball team than the New Orleans Pelicans. They deserve to be favored. But they do fit into the archetype of team that the Pelicans have had some advantages against. So I view this as the best possible outcome for them. I think they would have just gotten steamrolled by the Denver Nuggets. But I do think they have a chance to beat the Oklahoma City Thunder. As a matter of fact, like... They're 8-1 and one against the Warriors and the Kings this year. They're 3-1 and one against the Clippers, too. So, again, when you have teams that are initiated by finesse players from the perimeter, it plays directly into New Orleans' strengths, and Oklahoma City is led by a finesse guard in Shea Gilgis-Alexander. Now, that said, the season series went to the Thunder this year, 2-1. to one. Their last matchup, though, was in late March. That was during Zion's kind of tear through the league when he was uh, doing so much more on the basketball. 
No Brandon Ingram was in that game, but Zion was in. Obviously, the Pels had a late lead in that game, and Oklahoma City basically stole it on a couple of late threes by Shea Gilders Alexander and Lou Dort. So Thunder won the season series 2-1, but that last game in particular was super competitive, and the Pels could have easily won it. They just, you know, a couple shots go the different way. So a little more competitive than it might seem on the surface. Uh, one of the advantages there, we have some good crunch time possessions for us to look at, which I'll show you guys on film here in a little bit. Gambling odds. Oklahoma City is minus 700. I think that's crazy. Like, Oklahoma City is the better team, and they deserve to be favored, but I think the Pelicans have just as good of a chance to beat the Thunder as the Lakers do to beat the Nuggets. So, like, I would have put the line more in the minus 300, minus 400 kind of range. So, it's a value bet for the Pelicans. If you believe in the Pelicans or less so about belief, but more so about just betting value, that might be a line worth looking at. A uh, quick look at the Thunder on offense. It's going to be about the Pelicans being able to keep excellent point-of-attack defenders on Shea at all times. It's going to be a steady dose of Herb Jones at the start. I think Najee Marshall is going to see a good amount of time. Dyson Daniels didn't play much in the playing game last night, but he's another guy that I could see them potentially going to if Shea is getting too comfortable against those primary guys. Uh, the Pelicans are going to help really hard off of Lou Dort and Josh Giddy. You'll see some examples when we get to the film, but they're going to dig down on uh, uh, ball screens from the weak side. They're going to load up on that strong side of the floor, and they're going to play a lot of two-on-one on the back line if they get that skip pass across. They'll have Trey Murphy on the weak side like close out to the passing lane and try to bait on Lou Dort and Josh Giddy's kind of indecisiveness that they can have sometimes over there. Um, so again, rotation is going to be key. And then as you, as you can probably imagine, in my opinion, the biggest key of this series for the thunder on offense is going to be that weak side shooting of Lou Dort and Josh Giddy. If they're hitting shots, things are going to loosen up. Everything's going to be fine. But if they're not and the Pelicans can load up the strong side, they're good enough at the point of attack that they can probably stack, uh, uh, kind of like stall out this thunder offense. So that weak side shooting is going to be huge. Uh, the Thunder playing Jonas Valanciunas off the floor was something that I noticed in the March game. He only played 10 minutes and started the second half with uh, with Larry Nance Jr. instead. And so, again, that's going to be an interesting kind of thing. But I wonder if Zion being out changes that calculus at all. Uh, moving to Pelicans on offense, kind of similarly, I think uh, uh, one of the things I've, I forgot to mention this in the in the last segment, but. In the late game situation, there was a lot of effort uh, from the Thunder to attack CJ McCollum. They kind of viewed that as the primary entry point. So like either Jalen would attack him directly or they get use a ball screen to get him switched onto Shea and then Shea would look to attack. But they're looking to attack uh, uh, CJ McCollum, particularly in ball screens with Larry Nance. Try to get CJ onto the primary ball handler, then bring Larry Nance into the, the screen with Chet. Similarly, with the Pelicans on offense, a lot of it is about C.J. McCollum trying to hunt Shea Gilgis Alexander and Josh Giddy. Similar kind of thing. He'll try to get Shea switched onto him, and then they'll bring Giddy into the screen. So it's their two, uh, what they perceive to be their two worst defenders in that unit that they're bringing into the action. Uh, Lou Dort is probably going to get the uh, Brandon Ingram assignment. He was guarding Zion a lot in the uh, uh, in the March game, but obviously with Zion being out. I think they're going to go that uh, the towards Dort on Ingram. Either way, ironically, even if Zion, let's say Zion does make a return late in the series, I actually was impressed with how Oklahoma City defended him in that fourth quarter in the March game. Uh, Jalen Williams and Lou Dort both spent time on him there, and they did a good job just kind of flattening out his driving lanes and limiting some of his success there. Uh, as far as Dort on Ingram, Lou Dort's like a classic fire hydrant kind of guy. He slides his feet well, absorbs contact. Uh, and just kind of forces guys to shoot over the top. But Brandon Ingram's a professional over-the-top shooter. So that's a matchup I think Brandon Ingram will be okay in. The question is, who's going to guard C.J. McCollum? And my guess is it's probably going to be Jalen Williams. I think we'll see some Kaysan Wallace off the bench in that matchup as well. Really, it's this simple to me. If C.J. McCollum and Brandon Ingram can consistently get the defense in rotation, the Pels have some drive and kick talent. Dry, uh, Trey Murphy, you'll see some examples on the film. <clears throat> Trey Murphy's good at pump faking and driving closeouts. And uh, obviously, if CJ starting the play or Brandon starting the play, the other guy is on the weak side as well. They have enough drive and kick talent if they can get the defense in rotation. But that playmaking piece is going to be huge. And this is where Brandon Ingram comes in. 
Brandon Ingram's always been one of my favorite pick and roll passing wings that we have in the league. He's got long arms and he's good at reading the low man and making that skip pass, which is the key to getting the defense in rotation. So I think Brandon Ingram's going to play a significant role in this particular series as a primary shot creator. And ironically, you know, Brandon Ingram's fit when Zion's role in the way that he is, it can be a little clunky sometimes, but with Zion being out, it kind of plays directly into Brandon Ingram's strengths where he could be on the ball more. Uh, I'm picking the Thunder, but the Pels do match up well. And they have a great home crowd, and they have more playoff experience. Brandon Ingram and CJ McCollum have more reps in this type of environment. So I do think they're going to be able to drag the series out. But I expect the Thunder to win. I'm picking them in six or seven games. All right, let's take a look at the film. Again, I only have seven clips to show you guys. This is going to be pretty quick. This first one is an example of how the Pelicans will look to attack Oklahoma City in the half court. So watch how uh, CJ McCollum is going to try because he's got Jalen Williams on him. CJ McCollum is going to try to get Shea Gilders Alexander switched onto him first. So they're going to use Herb Jones to set the first screen and to get Shea switched. Once Shea is switched, then they're going to bring Josh Giddy into the action with a ghost screen with Trey Murphy. And you'll see Trey Murphy is going to run up, set that ghost screen. That's going to trigger the hedge from Giddy. That's going to buy a closeout situation for Trey Murphy. And now we can actually watch as Trey Murphy beats the closeout to the left with a little pump fake, draws Jay du- uh, Jalen Williams, uh, Jalen Williams, I should say, and help drop off past to Larry Nance for the dunk. That's going to be the most common type of attack that I think we'll see in the half court from the Pelicans, whether it's CJ or Brandon Ingram. I think they're going to try to keep Shea and che- or excuse me, Che and Josh Giddy involved in the action as much as possible. Uh, Here's an example of a defensive possession with Herb uh, Herb Jones uh, guarding Shea Gilgis-Alexander. They're also going to set a go screen with uh, with Jalen Williams. He's going to come up and kind of fake like he's going to set a screen and then slip out to the three-point line. Um, Watch Er Herb Jones, though. He does a good job sliding his feet, meeting him at spots, absorbing contact, and he has the length to get good contests. It's not going to be an easy first type of playoff matchup for Shea. Er Herb Jones is a very, very good defensive player. He's going to make him work hard for his looks. Here's another uh, late game kind of shot making piece from CJ McCollum. Uh, This is going to be, I think, again, shot making for CJ and Brandon Ingram is going to be key. They're going to run a screening action, but they're going to get Jalen Williams is going to get through it. And then CJ is going to go straight ISO here. So again, Larry Nance slips out of the screen. Uh, There's a dig down, which is going to cause a retreat dribble. Once the retreat dribble happens, there's only 3.6 seconds left on the shot clock. So CJ has to make a play, but he gets... Uh, he gets his, look at that. That's a textbook example of elite ball handling. Watch Jalen Williams as he jumps up onto the right side. As soon as he jumps up, boom, jumps up right. CJ immediately crosses back over to the right and beats him. Again, that's going to be a huge piece of the series for the Pelicans. All right, this is a big bucket from Herb Jones against Shea, or excuse me, from Shea against Herb Jones to show you that he can win that matchup sometimes too. I thought it was interesting the way the Pelicans guarded this. So we're essentially going to get a ball screen off of this kick out. We're going to get a ball screen with Shea and Chet, okay? What's interesting to me about this configuration is as Chet is setting the ball screen, Herb Jones is basically conceding the pull-up three here. Like he's not pressuring the ball. He's dropping back. Uh, um, obviously Nance is there kind of like in a little bit of like a high drop, but Herb Jones is leaning back. He's on his heels, which basically allows this shot from Shea. I wonder if that's a game plan thing. I wonder if the Pelicans are going to try to turn Shea into a three point shooter in this series, which may or may not work for them. We'll see. Here's another go screen with Trey Murphy just to show you uh, again how they're going to look to attack. So this ghost screen comes from a flare screen as well. So as he slips out of the screen, he's going to get a flare from Larry Nance right there. As he slips out, there's a baked in driving lane to the left, right? So he rips left, but he sees Shea come over to to uh, tag Larry Nance right there. As he sees that, he throws the skip pass to Herb Jones. This is going to be a big thing for the Thunder as well. How well can they contain these weak side closeout opportunities from guys like Herb Jones. And in this case, they do a good job and force a turnover. Nice job from Shea there. Here's an example of those weak side uh, two-on-ones I was telling you guys about um, with the Thunder. So Shea's going to beat... Uh, Shea's going to beat Herb Jones with a... Or with like uh, I think he might be uh, going against Trey Murphy here. Let's see. No, it is Herb Jones. But he beats him with a nasty left-to-right crossover. And when he beats him, boom... 
you could see the Pelicans already loading up. Trey Murphy's there. Now we've got this weak side situation. These are those weak side two-on-ones I'm talking about. So in a ball screen, this would be a tag, but in this case, it's just a help on a drive. But you're going to see consistently in the series, anytime the uh, the Thunder run some sort of action or someone gets beat off the dribble, they're going to heavy, heavy, heavy help here in the paint, and you're going to see a lot of this. You're going to see Josh Giddy in the corner or Lou Dort in the corner, the other one on the wing, and this, uh, uh, this man rotating down from the wing for the Pelicans is going to have to play two-on-one. And in this case, you could see pump fake. You're baiting on the... Uh, that was a classic uh, passing lane closeout from Zion Williamson, right? So Zion Williamson is going to close out into the gap between the two of them, right? Because he's trying to basically take away this pass while also preying on his indecisiveness. Ludor drives and kicks. Zion Williamson rotates. Back to, to Ludor. Notice none of the Pelicans are reacting to this. I'm going to rewind a little bit because this is actually kind of crazy. None of the other four Pelicans care. They're content to let these two guys notice Larry Nance is not rotating. He's content. He's digging. He's stunting, but he's content to let these guys play two on one over here. So uh, obviously it burned them and ended up costing them the game. <laughs> but, uh, but that is a strategy I do think we'll see from the Pelicans um, here in this series. Last one here, an example of the thunder picking on CJ McCollum. So Jalen Williams is Zion on him. Zion, it was kind of an interesting match because Jalen Williams is such a downhill kind of threat. They use Zion similar to the way they use him on LeBron where he would just kind of beat him to spots and use his physicality to kind of close off those driving lanes. But uh, obviously without LeBron, or excuse me, without Zion available in this series, that's going to be another advantage for Jalen to look at is he's just going to be stronger than most of the perimeter defenders he's going against. So we get the Lou Dort screen. That gets CJ switched on to Jalen Williams. Now he comes over the ball screen. We're going to uh, uh, reverse the screening angle here. And this is just really bad ball screen defense from Trey Murphy. Trey Murphy's on inside position. Excuse me. Trey Murphy's got inside position here on the Holmgren screen. And so when CJ goes to chase, now they're just screwed because Chet can easily screen both of them and he can get downhill. But again, that's what happens when you pull you know two pretty weak defenders into the action at the exact same time. Um, you're going to get an easy shot. And you end up getting, again, once he turns the corner there, it's just hopeless. And Larry Nance would probably be in better help position with this being giddy, but he's not. And that ends up icing the game here. So again, be, be on the, uh, the the lookout for the Thunder attacking uh, CJ McCollum as well. All right, guys, that is all I have for today, uh, or for this morning, I should say. As always, I sincerely appreciate you guys for supporting the show. Um, so we got all eight series previews. They're all up on the YouTube feed. Again, enjoy the games today. I'll see you guys after the final buzzer of Nuggets Lakers for an instant reaction.